A fascinating new documentary is uh, hitting Australian cinemas in April, a film called When the Camera Stopped Rolling. And it's my great pleasure to have uh, speaking to me right now, the writer director of this documentary, Jane Castle. Jane, welcome to Movie Metropolis. Thank you for having me, Peter. <laughs> now, I was really quite fascinated by this film because I saw it last year at the actor judging screenings. And uh, it, it, it was so revealing about your mother, uh, Lilius Fraser, and her experiences in the film industry um, harking back to the late 1950s, I think, is when she first began. Tell me about your journey in making this film about her. Well, uh, originally I actually did not want to make a film about her. <laughs> I wanted to make a film um, about death, in fact. But um, as it turns out, um, the film had other ideas and in this long process of funding and making trailers and write, script writing, it turned out it was a no-brainer that there was a film about my mother, you know, a pioneer of Australian filmmaking. Um, and it actually came from a story about her death. That was how we got from the film about death to this film about my mother. And, yeah, I was really like I was not, um, I was still a bit grumpy about the fact that mum's filmmaking had taken her away from, from us as kids and, you know, she'd gone off on location and, you know, we'd been left with terrible people and it was a very chaotic upbringing and it was kind of like the last thing I wanted to do. But then, you know, it was presented to me and I thought, right, okay, this is the film that wants to be made. I'm going to go all in. And it turned out, in fact, that I ended up having to be in the film too as part of the narrative. So that's how it came about. And I'm really glad it did, actually, because um, it meant that I, you know, got to bring some life to this otherwise unknown pioneer filmmaker and, and actually also sort out some of the issues I'd had with her during our um, somewhat fraught relationship while she was alive. So it was a bit of a win-win a in the end. Uh, it certainly was. And, and and I love, as you say, this parallel narrative that's going on about your own relationship with your mother, but also her, as you say, pioneering uh, work in film. And, and she had made over 40 films, uh, educational, industrial, commissioned films. And, and it's incredible that we don't know much about her. So uh, I suppose finding all this material and, and putting it all together must have been uh, quite a challenge for you. It was because I actually didn't know the depth of the archival material before we started. It wasn't like, oh, here's all the archival material and now I'm going to make a film. No, it was like this exploratory, you know, digging and discovering throughout the filmmaking process through her films. And in fact, it turns out she made what we believe is the first land rights film in Australia. Um, and digging through all these films and the negs that my dad was a photographer. So there, were all, there was all this photographic material I'd never seen before. And of course, you know, back in the days of letters, I got to go through all this written correspondence between my parents and other people. So the process became very iterative. Like as we would discover new things, we'd go, oh, that we can put that in here. And that changes the, the story a bit here. And so it was a very much a building process while we were digging into the archives. How interesting that is. And, and the films that she made, I mean, uh, from what I saw in the clips and so on, and, and I vaguely remember seeing a couple of those films um, maybe uh, before a main feature or something like that in, in cinema and so on as well, um, were very well constructed, um, uh, commissioned films in many respects, to, uh, to present a product or, or an issue or an event or, uh, as you say, land rights issues and so on. Uh, and it's, it's quite incredible. Was she self-taught? How did she become a filmmaker? Oh, yeah, great question, actually, because she was a very good, very capable craftsperson. Um, yeah, she started out um, at photography school, actually, at the Guildford School of Art. It's... It was one of the, or was the best photography school in England. And they also had a filmmaking unit. And, and she got really 
she got a bit, she was a very, very um, energetic person and she felt really stifled by the dark room, you know, and the stillness of the photos. And she actually, when she discovered moving films, she loved being out on location and dealing with people and then bringing the footage back to the editing room. So she actually made a film over there, which um, the footage is completely lost, but it was following the, the journey of a leaf from falling off a tree, you know, down a river, just a little black and white poetic film. And then she came back to Australia and tried to get work with Film Australia, but as a cinematographer, but they said, oh, you're too, you know, you won't be strong enough to carry the cameras. But she'd already made this beautiful film, it's called The Beach, and it was screening every night on the ABC before the news. It was in the times when they had that little, you know, five to ten minute visual holiday for people. And they showed that for months. And yet the, um, the film bodies, the institutions, said that, you know, she wouldn't be able to do it. So she undaunted, uh, well, if I can't be a um, cinematographer, I'll be a director. And so she kind of, she started to, to take on all the films at Film Australia that other people refused to make. And, and the first film in that respect she made was a film about the real estate guy, Richard Torrens, you know, Torrens title. It was just like a film about a bureaucrat. And apparently all the blokes had said, no, nope, we're not doing it, it's too boring. She said, well, I'll do it. And she, she made the film. It's a great little film. And, you know, she builds up this biographical material and uses animation. And, and so she, her enthusiasm was just undauntable, if that's a word. Uh, she was unstoppable. And then, you know, mining films, whatever. Like, she wasn't fussy. Um, she would just, she loved making films. So if it was a film about rice growing in the Riverina or weevils or, you know, bauxite mining or iron ore, she'd just jump into it. Um, and that was her nature. And, and it really held her in good stead in terms of building that huge archive of over 40 films. An incredible archive. And it'd be nice to see a lot of those films re-released in some way, shape or form so that we could experience um, her filmmaking style. Um, and hopefully that will be in prospect. But... Um, yeah. It's amazing, too, the story that she had to fight against this entrenched uh, masculine view that uh, women really, they can't lift cameras, I mean, how ridiculous, and that they can't be filmmakers because it's a, it's a male domain, uh, which, uh, you know, when, when you look back 50s and 60s, where, which was her heyday, I suppose, um, incredible period of time for her. It was, yeah, it was her golden age, actually, because... Even though the um, industry was very masculinist, um, there was a lot of work going on. And in fact, that was, uh, that was a part of the reason she teamed up with my father, Norman Castle, because it ended up, there was a lot of work out there, but um, without a, a male front man, it was hard to get it. So she sent him off to get the jobs and he was a great entrepreneur. And he could talk anyone into, into needing a film. And so they got tons of work coming in because there was a lot of work. And so as long as there was a, a bloke out the front, she, she could write, direct, edit, basically do all the creative stuff. And for a long time, that really worked for them. How interesting. And I suppose the, the parallel aspect of this is your own relationship with uh, Lilius and... Uh, uh, and discovering not just her films, but just d talking about your fraught relationship with her and the, and the issues and so on, which must have been, to some extent, perhaps a little difficult for you at time. Yes, it was. It was difficult, but also a little bit um, therapeutic. Um, difficult to, firstly, difficult to find what the truth really was. So having to drop down into this self-honesty, which I did because I knew it made the film stronger. And then like difficult now because I've exposed myself so much and it's like, oh my God, why did I do that? What was I thinking? You idiot. Um, but I really had no choice because the film demanded that kind of honesty and I knew to make it more compelling that that's what I had to do. 
Um, so, yeah, it's difficult, but it is satisfying to, you know, be able to tell my story. And also the other great thing about it for me was that my childhood, because of all the chaos that went on, was quite overwhelming and confusing. And it's been quite a good process for me to kind of order it into this kind of neat-ish narrative and to make sense like I think there's a line of the film in the film somewhere you know learning how to put a frame around the chaos and so making the film brought order to what had been quite chaotic so it's been quite helpful for me to you know understand and not feel so overwhelmed by history. Sure sure and fully understand that so tell me then as you say to uh, putting this film together and uh, uh, and having this sort of parallel aspect to it you obviously have lots of footage, um, uh, archival that you found, uh, etc. cetera. Um, how easy was it then to edit the film into a coherent story? Well, the editing was a, a gargantuan effort. And thankfully, we had Ray Thomas as editor. And he, you know, it's actually quite a different type of film than he has usually edited. He's done a lot of long-form documentaries and cinema verite. But he's been used to, I think, corralling um, a lot of diverse material and differing themes into a cohesive whole. And so we had his, his whole career, um, you know, his experience there sitting in the chair, um, mustering, mustering all this material into form and also mustering, I would just come out, I'd have a memory of something that had happened. I'm like, oh, this happened. Let me write it. What do you think of this? And he would go, oh, um, well, maybe not <laughs> or maybe. So um, it was a tricky process because also, you know, even when we decided the film was about the list, and a bit about me, we really didn't know what it was about because we were right. I was writing it while we were editing, actually. And it's a difficult way to work because it's time consuming. And thankfully, Pat Fisk, the producer, had the wisdom to allow the film to take that time because it just took that amount of time to, to find the core narrative and you know there are two characters in the film there's me and my mother and we've got intersecting narratives so it's quite a complex structure um so it really was more like an artwork like building it up you know bit by bit from the ground up rather than having a script and then you know applying it to the film it was it was really a, yeah a creative process and thank thankfully Ray was just like so strong and steady in that whole process that to hold me and all my kind of crazy ideas and memories and history, you know, in, in place. And that's great to see that the way that that has been put together. That's a, such an interesting process. And, uh, and, and it's great to see the film is being rolled out um, uh, in Australian cinemas in April. And hopefully it will get international coverage as well. Yes, well, it's actually still, it's been going through the US and Europe and it's still got some festivals. Um, it just happened with the timing of uh, the Sydney Film Festival, really, that, that we decided to, to go overseas first and then come back to Australia. But, yeah, it, it, there's lots of festivals that it's, it's slated for still in Europe and the US, we think. so, And we hope to get, we don't have yet, but like a distribution um, for Europe and the US. So that will be the next thing once we've released it here um, to get distribution over there and then also, you know, start to look at TV broadcasts and all the other kind of forms of distribution here in Australia. Okay, that's, that's terrific to see uh, that film, uh, the film being rolled out and certainly in Australian cinemas in, in April. And Jane, I'm quite intrigued by your own filmmaking background. How, was it your mother who inspired you or were there other inspirations for you to become a filmmaker? Uh, great question. Um, I think she was the unconscious inspiration for me because by the time I was thinking about careers when I was a kid, I looked at my parents' film business. It just seemed utterly chaotic. They were dreadfully in debt. And I said to myself, I am never going to be a filmmaker. Then comes along the HSC and, and you know, I loved 
the thought of art, but I was hopeless at drawing or painting or sculpture. And I thought, oh, what am I going to do? So I grabbed dad's super great camera and just started shooting black and white. And mum actually taught me how to see in black and white by giving me this little piece of red cellophane so I could see tone, like take out the colour and just see light and shade. So, and then as it happened, um, I actually wanted to be a social worker, but I applied to film school with this film and I just got in. I was like 19, I was so young. It was so random actually. But then once I got to film school, I was like, oh my God, I love cinematography. I love light. I was completely obsessive and obsessed and ambitious and driven like my mum. And I just wanted to be a cinematographer. And um, so, you know, being a writer director is a bit of a new phase for me, um, but a nice one. Cause you know, I think you, you know, as you grow as a person, you know, your goals change and your need for exp expression changes. And yeah, I think I've had more, like rather than just watching the film from behind a lens, I've had this need to express and to tell stories and, and to connect with people actually. So it's been pretty organic and, and not planned at all, but definitely Lilius, my mum, has been, you know, behind the scenes, getting in there into my psyche through all different ways. How interesting to hear that. That's uh, that's really a, a, a terrific uh, uh, journey, uh, if you like to put it that way. And um, what, in terms of then uh, of the studies that you've made in, into filmmaking or cinematography and so on, and in making um, how the camera stopped rolling, were there any particular films or filmmakers who perhaps are templates for you? Yes. I, I had, as my kind of role model films in the making of this film, three films and filmmakers that were really inspiring. And I guess historically the first one was Sunless by Chris Marker. Um, so very, you know, it, it's a landmark film and a lot of people have tried to replicate it, but there's something about the feel and the mood of that, the intensity of the imagery and the words. And then there's, of course, Sarah Polly's Stories We Tell, which is a, that fabulous Canadian film about mm her family um, and the thing I loved about that is that it was a really gripping story because you know as a cinematographer I knew there was a risk of me just indulging in images and not you know making a, a good gripping story so I really that was my kind of model for making it a really watchable film and then finally I'm Not Your Negro by Raoul Peck uh, just a stunningly powerful film. I'm, I'm not quite sure what I what I took from that. I think it's the archival and it's the intensity and the, the focus on uh, the spine of the film. And, you know, that's, that's three, it's actually three stories in one of three, you know, slain black activists. Um, and just the power and the, the authenticity of that film. So I think those three, I, I was really quite um, focused on them and just kept it to that and tried not to kind of look out outside and get distracted, you know, because there's a lot, there's amazing filmmaking going on, um, but I just thought, you know, I'll just stay in my own lane and make this film. Okay. And what an interesting eclectic group of, of filmmakers and films that you've mentioned there. That's a, that is really quite fascinating. And, and I notice in your filmography that uh, you've been involved um, with a number of films, including Leprechaun 2, which, which I found, I remember seeing was quite a lovely exploitation type film. Uh, you must be really, uh, no, 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 no. I mean, you, in filmmaking, you get involved in projects and, you know, whatever they are, they are, because that's part of the journey. And it must have been quite interesting for you, the different sorts of films you've already been involved with. Yeah, you're right, actually. A complete range, even from TV commercials, music videos, then the kind of B-grade horror film, and then art house feature films. Quite, quite a range, actually. And um, I guess I was involved in all of those because I had this very strong determination to become the best cinematographer I could be. So I just took anything and everything to try to hone my skills. Mm. Um, yeah, so that, it's one of the great things about being a cinematographer. You get these introductions to all corners of life, especially with documentaries. You just go into places that you would never have any 
entree into otherwise. So yeah, and it's I mean leprechaun too. You know, although I'm like embarrassed by it, it's a it's a bit of light relief in the film because um, it was kind of so bad, so bad it was good. In fact, I've met quite a few young people who, when I say that I worked on this film, they're like, oh, my God, we love that film. We watch all six leprechauns, like, all night with beer and popcorn and, like, oh, my God, you're my hero. And I'm like, oh, no, for the wrong reason. Anyway, but, yeah, they're, they're coming back, those cult films. They are, definitely, they are. I mean, uh, I've spoken to Brian Trenchard-Smith about uh, all of his uh, wonderful <laughs> B-movies, his adventures in the B-movie train and all that. And, and absolutely, there is a, there is a, a strong market for uh, films like this. So, <laughs> yeah. well done. Did, did he read Razorback, I think? I uh, don't think he yeah. did Razorback, no. But, uh, oh, yeah, yeah, but that was one of the classic Australian um, B-grade horror films. It is, yeah, yes, yes. Yeah. <laughs> so, Jane, what's next for you? Well, actually, I'm training to become a psychotherapist. <laughs> yeah. So I'm having an, a bit of a, a sideways career movement, um, but for me internally it makes sense. I'm going to, you know, follow up with this film, you know, like, keeping on um, promoting it, talking about it, and absolutely not saying no to, you know, other film possibilities in the future. But, you know, the, the film, you know, it has a very therapeutic aspect to it. And in a way, you know, I have been doing all that healing my whole life. And so I'm really having a break from the screen, actually, because there's this something about, um, you know, being behind the camera and then being behind the computer that, I just want to break through and have a bit more human to human contact. As they say, it's my growing edge. You know, like I got into film in the beginning as a cinematographer because it felt safe, you know, and I could, you know, hide behind the lens and not have to relate to people. But I feel like as a human, I'm just, um, yeah, I'm just kind of growing and I'm a bit more keen to be in relationship and, and help other people on their healing journeys, you know, the way I've been helped. So something different. It certainly is, and yet I, I can see the the process and and the development there. So it, it does make sense. I I can I can understand it. Well, look, I'm glad Jane, you can see. It. Yeah, <laughs> look, Jane, congratulations on when the camera stopped rolling, which is uh, releasing in Australian cinemas in April. Uh, and we've been speaking to writer director Jane Castle uh, about the film and about, in particular, her mother Lilius Fraser who features um, in the film. Jane, thank you so much for talking with me. Thank you, it's been a real pleasure. All the best. Good luck with the show. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Right. Thanks, bye-bye.